America's Heartland is made possible by... They make up a small part of our population, but have a huge impact on our lives. They take business risks few others would tolerate, all on our behalf. They're American farmers who feed, fuel, and clothe the world. Monsanto would like to recognize them for all they do for the rest of us. Because ultimately, our success and everyone else's depends on theirs. And by the American Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of agriculture. It insulates. We're not talking toxic chemicals, right? That's correct. It is a soybean base. It fuels. Use the soy diesel in the trucks on the road. So we figured, why not? Even cleanses and nourishes the skin. I shave with that. You shave with this. We're talking about soybeans. How could one little legume be packed with so much power? Well, we're about to find out. And a mommy. Close to the land. Hello and welcome to another edition of America's Heartland. I'm Jason Schultz. Well, not riding on a tractor today, no. I'm cruising around the back roads of Iowa in a Ford Mustang convertible. Why a Ford Mustang? Well, I'll tell you more about that later, but let's just say it has something to do with soybeans. Yes, soybeans. We're talking all about soybeans today, and for good reason. There's 76 million acres of them planted all over the United States, and Iowa is the number one producing state for soybeans. Why so many? Well, let's just say some folks call it the miracle bean. Harvest time in the heartland, and for many farmers, that means bringing in the beans. Harvesters creep along fields of light brown, gathering up these tiny bean pods to get the soybeans inside. U.S. farmers harvest more than 80 million metric tons of soybeans each year. Nearly half get exported as soybeans, soy meal, or oil, and you'll find them grown throughout the eastern half of the United States. The biggest soybean growing areas are the upper Midwest and the Ohio River Valley. If you live outside of that area, you likely don't see, let alone think about soybeans that much. But just check out the ingredients on items throughout your grocery store and you'll find soy. It's also in fuel tanks, industrial liquids, foams, and more commonly, animal feed. Driving across Iowa, you'll find rolling fields of soybeans at every turn. Just how can one little bean be so versatile? Well, I'll start my quest for the answer where beans grow. My first stop on this soy story is a farm, of course. Just outside of Mason City, Iowa, the Andregs have been growing corn and soybeans here since the early 50s. Like most farmers, they've grown over the years and diversified. Hey, Steve, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Good, good. What are we up to today? When I caught up with Steve Andreg, he was behind the machine shed fueling up his tractor. Right now, the beans on his farm are a couple feet tall, lush and leafy. Spring rains and the right temperatures means he's positioned for a good crop this year. Tell me about growing soybeans. Uh, are they tricky to grow, or more tricky than corn? Uh, what's it like to grow soybeans out here? Soybeans is actually a pretty simple crop to grow. As long as you wait until the soils are, are warm enough and, and you're out of any danger of freeze, uh, plant the soybeans and they pretty much grow on their own. The soybeans will start to turn in late August. They'll start to turn yellow and you'll see them drop their leaves and turn to a brown color and they dry down to about 13% moisture is where we want to harvest them at. And, uh, and that's when we're interested in the soybeans. After Steve harvests his beans, they'll end up getting processed. 
Oil is extracted and protein is turned into animal feed. Just under half of the soybean protein meal produced in the United States goes to poultry feed. The rest goes to things like pet food and cattle feed, and here in Iowa, feed for hogs. We have a large, large hog industry, and the soybean meal gets used up in that hog industry also along with the chickens and the turkeys and, and into the, some of the dairy feeds. Like farmers around the Midwest, you'll find Steve embracing the use of diesel fuel with a blend of biodiesel made from soybeans. There are different types of biodiesel made out of everything from discarded fryer grease to algae. But here in soybean country, soybean-based biodiesel is king. So what's the percentage of soybean oil in this fuel? Uh, we use 20% soybean oil in, the, in, in our fuel. Um, we blend it down from um, spring to summer, or to fall. Uh, we start out with 20% blend in the spring and we, we work it down to about a 10% blend in the fall. And really farmers are the number one users of soy biodiesel, right? They are. The, they, they really promote the products that, that, that we grow. Today, 700 million gallons of soy biodiesel are produced each year. Just in case I wasn't convinced about the growing popularity of soy biodiesel in these parts, Steve suggested a road trip. How you like those seats, Steve? Very comfortable. Let's go. So where are you taking me? We're headed to New Hampton over to the tractor pole. Are you an edamame eater? An edamame? I've never had an edamame. Ed ed no edamame? No. <laughs> <laughs> This is the National Tractor Pullers Association tractor pull in New Hampton, Iowa. You won't find these machines pulling a wagon on the back 40. So this is a pretty high octane environment here, right, Steve? It absolutely is. They can really get up and move. <laughs> here they call them super farm tractors. They're beefed up and attached to a huge sled that digs into the dirt as the tractor goes forward. Good times, but... What does a tractor pull have to do with soy biodiesel? They burn it in their tractors to make their tractors more efficient, and, and so we want to see how they do that in, in a high-class mill. A handful of the pullers tonight are using soy biodiesel in their tractors. We stop by to talk with one of them, Ted Leakty, a corn, soybean, and wheat farmer from Indiana. It's a 1976 uh, IH-1066. We're pulled in the super farm class. It's uh, 640 cubic inch. We're running a 3x3 three three charger. How much horsepower? We're running probably about 1,100 horsepower. Yeah, so you're not going to use that to plant the corn? No, it's only, <laughs> it's only good for about nine seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so you're using soy biodiesel in this thing? Uh, y yes, we are. Um, we use uh, soy diesel on the farm, and I use a premium diesel that is mixed with, so with, with, with soy oil. We've been running anywhere from 2 to 5 percent, depending on the, the cost factor, the economics of the whole, uh, whole thing, whether it's plastics or the soy diesel or whatever. That's that many more bushels of beans that we're going to burn, and in the end it's going to translate in more dollars per bushel of beans which is going to make me more profit. And that's a good thing, right? That's what it's the, we strive for. That's good thing game. for Steve, too. That is the game we play. We're trying to grow something and make a little money doing it. Soy biodiesel is created by combining the oil from crushed soybeans with methanol. That chemical reaction produces biodiesel fuel along with glycerin and a fatty acid byproduct. It's commonly blended at 20% biodiesel to 80% petroleum. Critics of the fuel say it's inefficient and takes more energy to create than it produces when burned. I know that there's that fear out there, but I, it doesn't concern me at all because it's a cleaner fuel. And right now we need to look at our environment and look at the fact that, that we three, need to clean three, it up. 
And soy biodiesel burns so much cleaner than their, our typical diesel fuels that, that it just needs to be used. Anytime you're using uh, food items like soy or corn for fuel, people start getting concerned about food prices, right? That's, that's true, but right now we grow enough crops not only to supply the food chain, but also to supply the fuel chain, both in corn and soybeans. Um, we have partners across the world that grow soybeans down in Brazil. As Americans look for more energy independence, a debate about biofuels has emerged. There are many ideas besides soy biodiesel on the table. Some scientists believe higher oil-based materials like algae make for a better long-term biofuel option. There's uh, lots of different kinds of biodiesel out there in terms of animal fat and grease and that kind of thing. How does soy fit into that whole mix? I think it's it's a piece of the puzzle. I mean, we grow a lot of soybeans in the United States that need to, we need to use up those bushels. But uh, but in order to supply diesel fuel for across the United States, it's just a piece. The rest of the biodiesels have to be used also. They're all good. We just like to support the soybean because that's what we grow. There's a lot more to learn about soybeans and many more uses for them. In fact, there's soybean ingredients right underneath these leather covered seats. The seats are made with foam made from soybean oil. Ford first introduced the soy foam in Mustang seats in 2007. They now have soy foam in one million vehicles. 40% of the seats foam comes from soybeans instead of petroleum. You're conserving petroleum products and you're utilizing a renewable resource instead of something that's limited. Ford expects to decrease its use of petroleum oil by 1 million pounds and reduce its carbon dioxide emissions by 5 million pounds annually. Henry Ford was a big proponent of the soybean, even fashioning this old soybean extruder. In the 1930s, he experimented with using soy for plastics. He even unveiled a car made out of soybean plastic in 1941. It weighed 1,000 pounds less than a similar car made from steel. He actually had the idea, could I grow a car? And he thought of all these different things that he's putting into his company, as far as raw materials and resources, is there a way to reduce cost by using an agricultural product? The soy car never made it into mass production, but more than 60 years later, Ford would likely be happy to see his soybean lab in Michigan going strong today. My next stop to find out more about soybeans, Iowa State University. In the heart of farm country, it's a school with a rich agriculture program. But before I talk to any experts, I find myself stopping off at a construction project on campus. With my hard hat on, I drop by Joe Steffes and his crew from Iowa Foam Insulators. When we do soy foam insulation, what we're doing is doing a lot of the sealing up of the gaps and the creases around the building and doing a lot of production on that. The foam being sprayed today is made from soybean oil instead of petroleum. Using a water base instead of CFCs adds to the environmental benefit. What we're seeing being sprayed here that's soybean base. We're not talking toxic chemicals, right? That's correct. It is a soybean base. Instead of using petroleum oil in the chemical, they use soybean in the chemical. And so he'll fill up this whole, this whole uh, little roof area here. Yep. Huh? Yep. He's going to go all the way around it. Now, obviously, the other way to do this could easily be with a petroleum-based foam, which might be a little cheaper. What's the What's the real reason why you? they wouldn't use the soy. Well, it's naturally renewable. It's always nice to use a product that doesn't come from oil or petroleum based. This is naturally something grown in Iowa in the Midwest that we're using to help support the economy. When it's sprayed out of the tube, the soy foam is a liquidy, foamy kind of substance, but within seconds it hardens up. Soy foam insulation. No air is going to get through there. I would think that in the Midwest, where there's soybeans everywhere, people might be a little bit more receptive to yep, that kind of yep. thing. Yep, uh, yep. A lot of our customers actually grow soybeans, or they know somebody that grows soybeans. So yeah, it gives you a real nice feeling that you're supporting those neighbors. The foam is growing in popularity outside of the Midwest, places like California, where home building has gone green. The soy foam does cost more than traditional insulation. It's a growing market. I mean, it's going to be a growing market for, I think, the rest of our lives because we're on this earth to sustain it and keep growing. If we're not, we're not going to be here very long. So as long as those farmers keep growing those soybeans, we'll keep spraying it. <laughs> very good. 
To get some insight into why this legume is so versatile, I visited Dr. Pally Peterson, a soybean agronomist at Iowa State. So these are some pretty good looking soybeans here, Dr. Peterson, right? They are awesome. They are tall. They start close to canopy here pretty soon, as you can see. When it comes to soybeans in Iowa, he's the go-to guy. He's in charge of the university's soybean research programs, looking into ways to increase the amount of beans harvested, reduce disease threats, and find new ways to grow a better bean. Farmers and other agronomists turn to him for insight into growing soybeans. So how soon before these are uh, ready to be harvested? Oh, right now we're in the middle of July, and um, this field here is an early planted field, so we can probably start finding, yeah, we can here. We can start, see here, we can start finding some parts. So I will expect uh, in uh, seven to eight weeks, so middle to late September. Good looking beans, but the real question for Dr. Peterson, how can they be used for so many different things? If you probably heard that, we call it the miracle crop because it's high oil and high protein content. Uh, is used for many things in industry today. How much protein in a 60 pound bushel basket of beans? 48 pounds of protein. The rest is oil. Initially, oils were discarded, but more recently, people are starting to realize the value in soybean oil. That's one thing we're looking today is what and the breeders are looking at too. How can we develop new varieties that both have good quality oils that we can use for human consumption, but also have high yields so the farmers can get paid well to plant these specific varieties. So we have tried to look at both angles right now. So the protein gets separated and turned into animal feed and food products. The oil becomes everything from biodiesel fuel to salad dressing. So today we have developed varieties that have no trans fat, meaning that we have a high quality oil that is compatible to other uh, edible oils like canola oil. That's why it's such a great crop to work with. There's always new markets and new opportunities, and there will always be a very strong demand for this crop because of that. Of course, the story of the soybean goes back long before farmers were planting them in Iowa. The first soybeans were traced back to China in the 11th century BC. After the Chinese-Japanese War of 1894, the Japanese began to import soybean oil cake to use as fertilizer. Ever since, soy has been a main component in Asian cuisine. But before I get to explore the importance of soy in Asian food, I discover soy biodiesel at work, hundreds of miles from those Iowa fields. This is the Harbor Queen, part of the Red and White Cruise Line fleet, docked at San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf. This tourist area brings in people from all around the world. And seeing the city and its landmarks by boat is a popular choice. And the Red and White fleet has gone green with biodiesel fuel. The vessels have large engines in them, and we, we consume about uh, 100,000 gallons in, a, in an average year. It, it reduces some of the uh, noxious gases that uh, contribute to the depletion of the ozone layer. Admittedly, most passengers don't even know about the soy biodiesel being burned down below. They're more interested in the San Francisco scenery. We're, we're out here with uh, dolphins and sea lions and pelicans and whales and we're, we're really interested in being able to get people out here on the water without you know, having a, a, a negative impact on the environment. Now to a more likely place to find soybeans in use, San Francisco's Japantown. 12,000 Japanese Americans live in San Francisco. They started arriving here in 1860, a hundred years later, the city created the Japan Center Shopping and Cultural Area. That's where I find Juban Restaurant. Juban is a Yakaniku-style restaurant where diners grill the meats at their tables. The meats are served with sauces. The main ingredient, soy sauce. Charles Kusuma is Juban's dining manager. It's basically a fermented type of uh, soybean. So they, they fermented that and then with a long time and then uh, they mixed it with some sugar and everything became soy sauce. And almost every single Japanese dish nowadays uh, comes with a whole soy sauce. So um, if, if it's not the soy sauce in the dish, then maybe it's a dipping sauce that has the soy. 
So <laughs> for Japanese culture, if there's no soy sauce, basically you cannot cook. If you tell the chef, oh, don't put soy sauce on it, they will get confused. What? How, how can I cook that, basically? So from soy sauce to small white chunks of gelatinous goodness called tofu. Originally from ancient China, tofu is made from coagulated soy milk. It's slightly harder than the jello, I'd yes, say, Yes, right? exactly, exactly. And yeah. then, and then, so you'd throw a little, what, soy sauce on this or uh -huh. whatever, you could eat this whenever, right? Yeah, exactly. But there's not much flavor. Not much, that's why you have to add the, the soybean sauce. But people eat this instead of meat. That's Many people, yeah, things, exactly, yeah. exactly, because uh, very high of protein because of the soybean itself. How popular is this sort of thing with just just tofu and salads and that kind um, of thing? It's in here. It's quite popular. We also have the tofu salad, mm -hmm. but it, we have to mix it with different kind of sauce to make it more flavorful. Okay. Just like lettuce, lettuce doesn't have too much taste if you mm -hmm. eat it just by itself. But if you add some sauce, some Caesar sauce or something, that it will become very very great and rich of the taste. Chefs love tofu because it's a great flavor carrier. It doesn't bring much flavor of its own, so add some great seasonings and sauces, and you're able to create some delicious dishes. And Japanese meals aren't complete without edamame. Yes, that's edamame. Talk about soy on the menu. These baby soybeans are picked right off the plant and boiled inside their pods with salt popular appetizer or snack. So you use your teeth to get them out? Although hugely popular in Asian restaurants, they are surprisingly not that well known in soybean country. You ever get any soybean farmers that, that are tourists that are come that come to San Francisco and go, whoa, I've never seen that before? Oh yeah, actually many people. Many people doesn't even know how to eat the edamame. They just see how they pick it off. They it's basically like the um, artichoke. The artichoke, you just eat it like that. Mm -hmm. you just. Uh, kind of pull it from your teeth and this is the same way of eating it and many people just say what is that how can we eat that but it's so traditional I want to try it and a mommy you wouldn't want to smear tofu all over your skin but what about getting some of that good stuff out of the soybean to use in skincare products that's exactly what this duo did back in the 1990s Lev Glasman and Alina Reutberg are the founders of Boston-based Fresh. Their boutique stores sell high-end beauty products. I caught up with them at their San Francisco Fresh retail store. Their soy experimenting started at the dining table. We got addicted to those uh, other mummies when you come home and you boil them, put salt on top of them, and you just like, eat them like nuts. And then you start uh, obviously reading about the ingredient more and more, and you're finding out that this ingredient was so rich in so many nutrients. There's gotta be a connection between whatever you consume on the inside, some of those ingredients that must be good for you on the outside as well. Soy protein has about 20 different amino acids, and those are the parts that we need to build proteins in our body, and our cells, our skin cells, are made of proteins. So it was a natural idea of thinking that, well, if they're renewing proteins in our body, you know, to help us sort of survive and nourish, what could it do to actually a skin? Lev and Alina focus on natural ingredients in their products. Soy actually came after successfully incorporating milk into beauty care. Their first soy product was a cleanser. It's an amazing cleanser. Not long after the cleanser, they released a soy-based cream. Lev and Alina wanted to prove just how refreshing soy is on the skin. And since I've got to sit on soy, watch it race, see it sprayed, and eat it, I figured, why not? As you see, the, the texture of it is pretty incredible. It's very, very, very unusual. So this is the soy face cleanser it's right here. It's a soy face cleanser. It's, it's, it's a very, very, very gentle oh, uh, yeah. texture. It's absolutely incredible. All right. What cleanser are you using right now? Uh, you, uh, don't, you don't want to know. It's uh, yeah, so don't, don't bar, bar soap. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> It's very, very fresh. This the is cleaning way, my pores right now. It's cleaning your pores, and also what it does is that, because in this particular cleanser, uh, not only are you creating a protection to barrier in your skin right now because of the amino acids from the soy, it also gives you a tonifying effect from 
um, from the cucumber. You should uh, market this to some of those Iowa soybean farmers, right? Oh yeah, it's their own uh, soybeans, right? Of course. I mean, I mean, they they growing the soy. They know the benefits of it. I mean, they might as well start using it on their faces. They're gonna have a clinic in some farm field that. Uh, uh, that'll be very interesting. Wouldn't that be fun? Know? It'll be gorilla clinic. Right. All right, so we'll add up the list. We've got animal feed, fuel, we've got food, tofu, soy sauce, lots of different things. And of course, we've got these great skincare products. Yeah, the soybean, it really is an amazing plant. That's gonna do it for this edition of America's Heartland. Make sure to check us out online at americasheartland.org for video streaming and stories from today's show. We'll see you next time. To order a copy of this broadcast, visit us online or call 1-888-814-3923. The cost is $14.95 plus shipping. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland Living close to the land There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's heartland living close close to the land America's heartland is made possible by they make up a small part of our population but have a huge impact on our lives they take business risks few others would tolerate all on our behalf they're American farmers who feed, fuel, and clothe the world. Monsanto would like to recognize them for all they do for the rest of us. Because ultimately, our success and everyone else's depends on theirs. And by the American Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of agriculture.